Okay, so a warm welcome to everybody joining us for the uh, third session of our sixth annual IS Entity Festival. Uh, we've had two sessions this morning. Um, one was on uh, looking towards inclusive science communication from rethinking images to global movements, um, changing narratives uh, in terms of lived experience. Um, and then we went to public engagement and citizen science from disease awareness to data, looking at various um, issues in terms of and projects from across the world. And they're kind of looking, touching at the role, potential future role of museums in all of this cohesion when it comes to citizen science and the community. Um, and uh, this session is going to be about capturing community voices for research and health advocacy. I'd just like to say a, a warm welcome to panelists, Dr. Caroline Cassard from the Global Partnership for Zero Leprosy, part of the Task Force for Global Health in the States. We have Tice Brito joining us from the NHR in Brazil. Uh, Dr. Kareen Atikem, epidemiologist and research coordinator at Sightsavers. And uh, Dr. Maxim Kenneth Anolitho from the Mabara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. So... A warm welcome to everybody. Um, hi there, and thanks for joining us. I think we're going to start with Caroline with your um, presentation. So if I could ask the presenters just to mute their video and their microphones, and I'll hand over the floor to you, Caroline, now. Um, so Caroline, over to you. Great. Thank you, Cameron. Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Caroline Cassard, and I'm the communication specialist at the Global Partnership for Zero Leprosy. Today, I'm going to share about how we engage and work with persons affected by leprosy when we develop campaigns. First, I'd like to give a little bit of background on GPZL. We are a coalition of individuals and organizations that are committed to achieving a world with zero leprosy. And our vision of zero leprosy includes no disease, no disability, and no discrimination or stigma. Persons affected have been involved in the partnership since our founding in 2018. And persons affected sit on our leadership team because we look to them as disease experts and the voices of persons affected are critically important to our work. World Leprosy Day, which takes place on the last Sunday in January each year, is our biggest day to raise awareness of leprosy globally. It's a celebration of the leprosy community and an opportunity to raise public awareness of this disease. Persons affected have been organizing grassroots campaigns for decades all around the world, especially around World Leprosy Day. So this International Day is an opportunity for all of these organizations to stand together. That's why when we design an international campaign for World Leprosy Day, we use a bottom-up approach to amplify the voices from grassroots movements. We led the development of our community's shared World Leprosy Day campaign alongside our partners, including many organizations of persons affected by leprosy. So now I'd like to share about how we collaborate and how we build this campaign together. We work closely with ILEP, which is one of our founding partner organizations. ILEP is the International Federation of Anti-Leprosy NGOs, and their organizations work with persons affected at the community level. We meet regularly with communicators at ILEP organizations in a community of practice, and it's through this community of practice that we collaborate and seek input on campaign messaging from persons affected. We reach out to organizations of persons affected to inform the campaign direction because we all agree that the most critical messages come from grassroots organizers. And these are people with lived experience of the disease. 
Since persons affected have been self-organizing for decades and our partners at ILAP organizations work closely with these groups at the local level, we have a very wide network of persons affected. Um, these include national and local organizations. A few examples are on this slide, like Fela Hansen from Colombia, Morhan in Brazil, Purple Hope Initiative in Nigeria, and IDEA's national chapters, such as IDEA Nepal and IDEA Ghana. So before we start creating our campaign, we survey organizations of persons affected around the world to inform the theme and the key messages. It's a really simple Google form that we make available in several languages. And we ask um, participants what topics we should talk about and prioritize on World Leprosy Day. Last year, the survey results showed a need to emphasize dignity and equal rights for persons affected by leprosy. And the theme input included sharing empowering stories of transformation and the need to end discrimination and stigma and abolish discriminatory laws, as well as the desire to celebrate voices of persons affected in several languages. So this all then informed our theme. And we came back with the ILEP communicators and came up with the theme United for Dignity. And this campaign for our past World Leprosy Day called for honoring the dignity of people who have experienced leprosy by sharing empowering stories and advocating for mental well being and the right to a dignified life free from disease related stigma. Our partners then supported content development for this theme and the key messages by providing photos, dignified life stories, and impactful quotes that we could incorporate in a social media kit. And we developed this social media toolkit to share with our partners and our broader network within global health and included photos and stories of individuals affected by leprosy in Nepal, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Ethiopia, and Nigeria to really create a, an international campaign. We then translated all of the content in several languages to make it more widely available as well. Here's one post, for example, a story of Petili Maya, she joined a self-help group with other people who had experienced leprosy in her village in Nepal. And together they transformed their community's stone path into a road so that people can reach the school and health post more easily. Here's a second post from the toolkit about Nuhu. His late leprosy diagnosis led to disability. With the help of an artificial limb, he now lives a dignified life in Nigeria. And he says, now I will be able to care for my animals and the land that was given to me. And a third example from the kit is a story from Mohammed in Indonesia. He said, the stigma attached to leprosy affects a person much longer than the disease itself. That's why I'm so motivated to fight leprosy. And now that he's leprosy free, he leads a group in Indonesia to end discrimination and encourage early diagnosis. Our campaign culminates with a final video. Uh, we reached out to our partners and asked them to invite individuals who have experienced leprosy and share what dignity means to them in their own words. So I'm going to play that for you now, and we can take a look at it together. Dignity is a Hansen's disease, free world, 
and with people affected free from prejudice, discrimination, stigma, full of opportunities and respect for life, for our lives. मेरे हिसाब से जो लेप्रोसी अफेक्टेड पीपल हैं उनके लिए डिग्निटी जो है वो ये होनी चाहिए ताकि उनका समाज में और जो कानूनी अधिकार है वो नॉर्मल लोगों की तरह एक समान होना चाहिए उनको उनसे कोई भेदभाव नहीं होना चाहिए डिग्निटी स्पेसिफिक Dignity is living a life with full of joy and happiness with the loved ones in the same family and society and enjoying equal opportunities as other people in the same community. É ser igual. É ter direitos como qualquer pessoa em qualquer lugar do mundo. É ser vista como eu sou, uma mulher negra, mãe divorciada e militante. É ser livre e não ter medo do preconceito e da discriminação. They can equally access uh, health services, education and livelihood opportunity. Now I am a program manager working for people affected by leprosy and with other disabilities. My family and my community accepted me with my disease. So I can say that I am living dignified life. ये आप सब लोग जिस प्रकार मेरे साथ दिया आप जो कुछ लोग से प्रभावित लोग हैं उन लोग के भी साथ दीजिएगा ताकि वो लोग भी एक सम्मान जनिय जीवन को वो लोग व्यतीत कर सके और आप आप सब को धन्यवाद दे सके. As we saw in the video, each person contributes a different perspective and a different lived experience to the leprosy community. So to center their voices in the campaign, we wanted to hear directly from persons affected in their own words. And we were able to include perspectives from Brazil, Senegal, India, and Nepal in the video. This video really brought grassroots voices to the forefront of our shared global campaign for World Leprosy Day. Thank you for joining today. And if you have any questions after today's events or would like to discuss persons affected involvement in campaigns, please feel free to reach out by email. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Caroline, for that. Um, very powerful messaging when lived experience is touched upon. Uh, I thought that was very interesting. And I wonder how much resonance you're able to generate um, in terms of uh, taking that leprosy me uh, message across cultures, as it were, not just the Indian leprosy community, as it were, but outside of that. So I wonder how, how well that played out. I'm sure that will come into the questions at the end. Very interesting thing about leprosy, that it's one of those NTDs where actual change has been made at policy level in terms of employment law in India because of the advocacy of organizations such as yourselves and the leprosy worldwide leprosy community um, managed to change um, employment law to make it more inclusive for, for people with leprosy um, in India. So um, there's a lot of uh, fruit, as it were, on the tree to be picked yet. So I'm sure the questions will come through um, as we go along. So thank you very, very much for that, Caroline. Um, that brings us to our next um, speaker from NHR in Brazil, Dr. Tais Brito. Tais, um, I think I'm just going to hand over the floor to you. This is a very early morning for you as well. It's kind of afternoon here, but thank you very, very much for, for joining us. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who is uh, joining our session. So um, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Thais Brito. I am a journalist working for NHR in Brazil, which is a Brazilian office of NLR. And I will be talking about uh, a video that we made uh, to summarize and to show a bit of our work that we do for this project called Social Economic Rehabilitation 
which is targeting people affected by leprosy in the states of Rondonia in Brazil. Um, but first, I'm going to give a, uh, you a background of what we do as NHR Brazil. We work with, in articulation with NLR uh, and along with other members of the NLR Alliance, such as uh, Mozambique, uh, India, Indonesia, and Nepal. We work towards a world feel free of leprosy. And as an office in Brazil, we support activities and we promote projects since 1994. And uh, you should already know that Brazil is the second country with the highest number of new leprosy cases each year. Uh, so we have an average of 28,000 cases per year before the pandemic. And for the last two years, we know that the numbers are a little um, uh, downsized by the challenges of the pandemic. And in Brazil, we work uh, with a focus in five uh, federal states, which, which are Ceará, Pernambuco, Rondônia, Bahia, and Rio Grande do Norte, uh, basically up in the north and northeast regions of Brazil. And what we uh, aim to do here is to influence national policies and also support research uh, contribute with uh, prevention of leprosy, prevention of disabilities, social inclusion, social inclusion, empowerment of leaders, and stigma reduction for people affected by leprosy, but also with other NTDs. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the project that we capture in this video. I'm going to show you a bit later. Um, this is a project that we have since 2017, and it targets uh, people affected by leprosy and their family members involved in self-care and self-help groups in the states of Rondonia. So we work with a close partnership with the government, the health department in Rondonia, and we also uh, have the support from the Brazilian Ministry of Health. And uh, the goal is to help them by uh, generating income, promoting social interaction, and with these activities, they also regain self-esteem and can uh, see new hopes and dreams for their lives beyond Hansen's disease, beyond leprosy. So in this project, we have, uh, we have promoted workshops with gastronomy in 2017, in which uh, those people involved uh, learned how to make new recipes and to uh, make uh, food to sell and to help their incomes in their families. Because we know that leprosy uh, can, um, can have an impact on their life uh, and their sustainability, financial, uh, needs in their families and in this project since 2019 um, the workshops were helping them to make bio jewels which are necklaces earrings bracelets and accessories made of natural product products from the amazon region so they use seeds uh, wood and other materials that uh, they can collect from nature or uh, materials that would be otherwise uh, thrown out. In 2019, we have those first participants in those workshops having their uh, registration as artisans. And with this, they could uh, sell their product products at local fairs. Um, and as the years, uh, as they year went by, uh, they participated in other workshops, exploring multiple techniques and collecting seeds and materials from the forest with the help of a facilitator, which is an artisan in Rondonia. Because of the pandemic, this project had to, uh, 
had to explore our virtual meetings to continue their learning experiences because, of course, they could not meet face to face anymore during this period. And it was an opportunity also for them to explore online marketing. Some of them made Instagram accounts to sell their products or other ones could sell their um, materials through WhatsApp. So um, NHR Brazil and the faci facilitation of this project helped them uh, exploring those alternatives. And in October in 2021, uh, we could promote again a face-to-face -face workshop, uh, engaging new participants and maintaining the ones that were already involved to actually go back together, interact and make their products. Um, and a good result from this activity was that they produced 50 new products to exhibit at a fashion show that was promoted at Porto Velho Mall in the capital city of Rondonia. And this event was very nice and huge for them. Uh, I had the participation of the Ministry of Health, mul multiple local partners from the health departments and all the people that were involved somehow with the project. And uh, with the articulation of Mohan with uh, the social movement for people affected by leprosy in Brazil. Uh, we had the participation of Miss Universe Rondonia, Miss Teen Rondonia, and Mr. Rondonia, who gave a very nice uh, touch to the event, helping us with the rehearsals and um, actually uh, helping everyone to show the, the jewels in a nice way and uh, helping to actually build the fashion show the way it was. So this event and the workshops and um, every face-to-face -face activities that this project had uh, were seen as great opportunities for us to tell stories and to communicate about uh, what we do and what uh, we can, how can we change the lives of those people? And uh, usually we have those stories uh, told through texts and photos in our website and social media so that we can share with our partners and stakeholders. But uh, these were also seen as great opportunities for us to think about videos and uh, a visual and nice way to document um, this project. So we have made already four videos with the help of a company video in Rondonia called Casa Quatro Videos. So um, in 2020, we made a documentary um, that is available on our YouTube channel called Beyond Hansen's Disease, Stories of Hope. And uh, based on these activities from um, 2021, we have made a series of short videos with three episodes called Art and Rehabilitation and uh, a video that came out this year about the fashion show. And this one that I'm going to show you is the last in the slide. It is called We Are More Than a Diagnosis. And uh, it was released I think about 10 days ago. So it's very fresh for you to see. Um, so basically we try to, what we try to do with those stories is to um, voice, um, voice their needs to have people affected talking about their stories with the disease. How was the diagnosis, the treatment, how they experienced stigma or not, and what happened after. Uh, for example, in this project, it was important for us to know how the self-care and self-help groups helped them and how was their experience with the project, how it changed their lives. And uh, we try to focus on their perceptions and feelings so that they can guide us uh, into the project and into what we do. 
And uh, what we try to do for this project and for everyone, every project that we try to document and uh, write about is to uh, make questions about their dreams and hopes for the future also, so that we cannot uh, only focus on their past and their story with the disease, but also see them as persons who have dreams and aspirations and a life outside of the disease. So they are not defined by it. And um, when we need um, more information, we go to local partners and our team to help to explain the project uh, for the technical side of things. Um, what we try to do also with uh, our stories is to evidence the impact of the, our project for people affected by leprosy, um, to inspire also, uh, because we know that other health professionals and other managers um, assess our materials. So uh, we try to um, we try to show that it is important to have an holistic approach for leprosy. They need more than di the diagnosis, the treatment. These are also very important, but they need to be seen as a whole. And uh, sometimes they will need me mental health support and financial support. So we try to show that this is, um, this is important to be taken into consideration. And because we know that um, other beneficiaries also assess those materials, we try to make them uh, the stories positive, to bring hope to people affected by leprosy about their potential, and also um, to attract donors to finance the project in other states of Brazil. Uh, in this specific video, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the process. Um, we knew that we had uh, workshops and a fashion show coming, so we were trying to decide what to do with this in terms of um, telling stories. So we had a, a quick meeting and we brainstormed a bit with the International Communication Advisor and at NLR, who gives a great support and that uh, I'm sure he is here watching also, Stefan. Um, so in this quick meeting, we decided that uh, a good option would, would have a short video uh, with a positive and emotional message, uh, especially because we wouldn't have uh, too many resources to have this video as a paid advertisement in other channels, so uh, as it as we wanted to make it uh, a video that would be organically spread and uh, that would be attractive to other stakeholders and other um, channels, we wanted to make it short and impactful. So the main purpose also was showing abilities rather than disabilities and uh, showing those people in a way that uh, they are not defined by the disease uh, as persons and uh, showing that um, another light of uh, their lives. So with these ideas in mind, we briefed and uh, tried to create a, a script along with Casa, Casa Quattro videos. Uh, they also have a creative team who talked to us and for us it was very important uh, to have them on board because they knew the project since uh, 2019. They were already very comfortable around those people and they, uh, they gave very good ideas for the script based on what they already knew also about the disease. And we agreed that we wanted to have images of the many steps of the process of making the bio jewels. So we wanted to share, we wanted to show group work, learning moments, preparation, the moments of happiness that happened to them, uh, the rehearsals and the fashion show itself. So, and we agreed to have the script uh, where a person would 
uh, talk about those moments with a voiceover, evidence and hope, resilience and courage. And in fact, this was a text that we have agreed upon, but it was very aligned with the testimonials and the quotes that we have heard over the years, because uh, in the previous videos, um, we have the, the quotes and the interviews made with all of them. So it was, it was not very, it did not go very far from what they talk about um, when they share with us what it is to experience this project. So I'm just gonna invite you to see the video. I'm just going to share with you. Nós somos mais que um diagnóstico, mais que o preconceito, mais que os obstáculos. Somos fortes para resistir, persistir, lutar e vencer. Nós nos unimos em busca da evolução como pessoas, artistas e empreendedores. Nossas mãos ensinam e têm o poder de transformar. Acreditamos nas oportunidades e estamos aptos a seguir, com a certeza de que o amanhã será diferente. Nossa força vem do norte, da Amazônia, dos seus frutos e flores. Em nosso sangue corre bravura e há uma marca em nós, a marca da superação. Just to conclude that our inspiration is raising awareness about leprosy and other NTDs when uh, we are talking about other proje projects too. Uh, and we try to do that through personal and inspiring stories of people affected. And uh, we try also to evidence the positive changes that reflect also uh, about challenges that many others still have to face. So we we show stories of people that already um, uh, experienced stigma and are in a good place, for example, but we try to highlight that this could happen to another person who is discovering uh, the diagnosis uh, right now. And our task and our challenge is to find solutions to communicate about complex and neglected team themes in Brazil. So to conclude, uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to show our work and our video. And if you have any question, you can contact us at our email or follow us on the social media or check our website. It's in Portuguese, but I'm sure you can see a bit about the communications and our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Thais, for that. That was fantastic. I mean, to go from, from patient to a fashion show is uh, rather spectacular, I thought. I think it really answers a lot of the questions. We saw from the previous presentation, the Caroline, that uh, some of the people that they were, the messaging coming out from grassroots was about employment, and it was about having the, um, a life outside of the disease, and you really captured that in your work. Uh, specifically, and I would also want to give a shout out to Stephen Labib as well, who have been in touch with originally, and he put you, you forward for all of this. So thank you both to yourself and to Stephen for making that happen. I'm sure there's some questions already coming through, and for both presentations, Joanna Butler, wonderful, uh, Professor Rod Dillon, wonderful, um, you know, some great um, feedback from the audience as well and to the audience I would say please do say hello and put your organization and country uh, that would be great we've got people all the way from Indonesia the Dr. Helena Uliatha from the National Institute of Health uh, in Indonesia um, from Belgium uh, Dr. Tina Husa who was on the previous uh, panel um, a lot of uh, people on there, so just please don't be shy. Please say hello and your name and country. Fantastic presentation and fantastic work, Tice. Thank you very, very much for that. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back for the um, for the, um, the the Q and A. And we've got Karine Atikem as well. Karine Atikem from the epidemiologist research coordinator at Site Savers, one of the largest and well-known NGOs uh, on the planet. 
uh, at the moment. So uh, I think it'd be wonderful to hear, Kareem, your presentation as well. So thank you very, very much for making time. Um, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll back off and I'll just I'll leave the floor to you. So over to you, Kareem. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karina Tekem, and uh, I'm the Entities Research Coordinator at Site Savers. And uh, a bit away from leprosy, I'll be talking about um, COVID and how we, we did a small survey to actually assess the reach and utility of COVID preventive measures and the information in the nomadic population in the West region of Cameroon. Um, next slide. Okay, this study was carried out in the Masangam Health District, which is uh, found in the West region of Cameroon, and uh, where we have been carrying out our entities' activities in this area. So, but first, um, let's start with our um, small screen. A group of people who are constantly moving from one place to the other, purposely in search of uh, pasture for their cattle in which case we will term them pastoral nomads. And sometimes uh, the males often and the older children, they move to riverine areas during the dry season, leaving the females behind in their base camps, and then they only return during the rainy season. And this we often term as semi-nomadic population, which is typical of people in this West region. And then they are mobile. Uh, there are remote settlements and um, which are far from the main communities, difficult accessibility to these camps, and there are also language and cultural differences from the settled community. We, this group of people are actually hard to reach and they are often missed out in the health interventions targeting the community inequities or being systematically uh, missed during interventions, but they sometimes uh, 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 impact the spread and control of several diseases as they, however, uh, a source of re source of reinfection in the community. And in cases like uh, pandemics, like COVID, it can be more challenging. Okay, so um, the first case of it was experienced in Cam of Cameroon, and. And within months, it actually spread to other parts of the country. And uh, following this, the Ministry of Health, together with other ministries in the country, um, instituted some measures to kind of crop down this uh, the spread of the disease. Some of these measures included the closure of public places, churches, schools, and funerals, no gathering of more than 50 people and the uh, urban and international travels were kind of restricted. There was also wearing of face masks, which was compulsory, hand washing, um, using hand sanitizers and, and all those measures. And then we also had communication messages uh, that um, uh, about the disease transmission, the signs and symptoms, preventive measures, which were also which were sent out in the form of posters, uh, banners, um, um, uh, uh, posters and banners in both French and English, which are the two official languages of the country. And then they were posted in public places, in schools, just like that. And then we also had uh, the TV and radio um, channels that talked about the disease or for information and also to, to report cases. And later on, a later part of the year, uh, activities were suspended, field work was suspended, uh, health interventions were suspended, including mass drug administration for neglected tropical disease. Uh, it was during this period where once these uh, activities were stopped, were halted, um, we received information from one of our uh, nomadic we coming to the community. So in the trying to explain to him why we stopped coming, we said there was uh, activities have been halted because of COVID. He was curious and like, what is COVID? I have never heard of COVID. And with that, it, it kind of triggered us to 
want to find out uh, with this lack of information, despite the communi uh, communication that has been going on about COVID at that time. So the team, our research team decided to carry out this survey to assess the availability and the reach of this COVID information within this nomadic uh, community. So um, the study was conducted around the research communities uh, we have the Makops up, the Makankun and Jinjang in the Masangam Health uh, District where nomads are found. So we have the main city communities where we have small patches of uh, the nomadic um, population and nomadic community. So they move seasonally, as I earlier explained, during the rainy season, they move, during the dry season, they move and then um, they come back to the main communities when the rains have come back. So. It was doing our uh, implementation of one of um, um, entities activity targeting this nomadic population um, through the test and treat for oncocercosis where we um, suspended this activity and only resumed uh, towards the end of the year. So it was actually an exploratory uh, qualitative study designed, conducted between September and October when we resumed uh, field work using semi-nomadic uh, interviews and questionnaires and focus group discussion. We interviewed um, about 27 participants spotted in nine camps in these three communities. And uh, we used uh, interview guides to facilitate discussion. Interviews were all uh, were conducted in a language that they could understand uh, because some of them were, uh, um, their educational background, we uh, conducted this, uh, interviews in languages where they can be freely, where, where they're comfortable. And in case of uh, where we needed translation, we would work, we worked with the local guide, uh, one of their community member. So these interviews lasted about 30 to 45 minutes and were recorded. Now uh, we recorded this, um, these audios, we transcribed them verbatim and the thematic analysis were used to identify codes, analyze them further and organize them in teams and sub teams. So we have, we had three main teams, understanding COVID, assessing information and prevention and care. Okay, as far as understanding COVID was concerned about COVID, why is, uh, most of them understood COVID as a new disease that is affecting many people. Some hadn't heard about it and some knew about the signs and symptoms, uh, transmission routes such as uh, the cough and the fever and how it could be spread through droplets, handshake, and close proximity to affected people. Others were unaware at all. They were not, they never had any idea because they had not seen a case of COVID in their community. Now, some commonly held, um, some common held um, concern was the potential of transmission of the COVID-19 to their cattle and whether the cattle could actually contract the disease and become ill. And people also attributed the transmission could uh, be possible when they have the disease, only when they have the disease. And those they believe that um, uh, they believe that they could not uh, have the disease because they were not sick. There was no sick person in their community which was affected. And this, however, um, affected the, perce the perception and belief of COVID. Like it wasn't real this disease doesn't exist. And even if it did exist, it affected um, uh, people in big towns and settled communities and they who lived in the bush were not affected, were not at risk of contracting the disease. Now, some also express the fear of contracting the disease as they leave the camps. For example, the men, the men who often leave the camp, they, some, they express some level of fear because they left the camps and then visitors too, who might bring the disease to their camps making them to feel women were less at the risk of catching or, or contracting the disease compared to the men. Yes. As far as access to COVID information was concerned, some of the nomads mentioned that they heard about the COVID uh, from the marketplaces where they go to pray in the mosques during community gatherings. 
either in the hospital or um, meeting places. And if you mentioned radio, uh, radios and the uh, COVID songs and uh, phone and telephone um, uh, calls, but some also said they heard when they visited these big towns or when um, they leave the camps to go to uh, to visit their their relatives or when the husbands even come back to their to their house or to their camps and tell them about what they heard outside of. Uh, what, what they had in the market. So this was typically for women. And then also we, uh, come heads were also an important source of uh, information. Now, as far as disease prevention and care was concerned, some of them mentioned wearing face masks to prevent, um, to prevent them from having the disease and also protecting others, especially when they are in gatherings or when leaving their camps. Why others wore it for fear of being arrested of pay fine by for administrative purposes because at one point it was like you need to wear your mags or you have to pay fine so some were just wearing mags for to evade pain or fine some wore mags because others were wearing them and hand washing and social distancing was also mentioned as a a measure of prevention from contracting the disease as well as spreading it but uh, they didn't give like a fixed distance. Some were saying one meter, some were saying four meters. Some just mentioned, just give a, just sit far away from another person. The importance of self-isolation uh, was also mentioned as a way of um, preventing the transmission of the disease. And uh, uh, others mentioned vaccination as another way and others mentioned med medicine, which could be given to prevent the disease. Few mentioned about um, God and the, the use of prayers that can save them from the disease. Uh, as far as um, adherence to preventive measures, it was mainly due to co cohesion from forces of law and order. In as much as some people were, um, pray, peer pressure and the behavior of others encourage some people to wear masks, um, uh, it also discouraged some others. For example, they would say, I don't see this person wearing masks. Why should I be wearing masks? But on the other hand, many people wear masks because you see others wearing the masks. So it was some sort of a suicided um, uh, kind of thing. So also cultural, cultural practices, um, also influence adherence and access to information. For example, the cultural practices of women not leaving the camps to the market or other places actually pose a challenge in them not accessing information. And uh, another issue was this gender in the sense that the dependence of women on their men, on the camp heads for information when they return to the camps limited them from information from these men as for example, some of these men can forget to pass on the information to their wives or to their family. So we had these um, uh, we had these issues around adherence, and one of the difficulties that they mentioned, no barriers to um, uh, accessing or um, uh, having a uh, um, uh, accessing um, preventive measures like water. They mentioned the uh, lack of water, especially during the dry season. And their main source of uh, water in this area was is dock up uh, wells and streams, which often which, which uh, dry up during rainy uh, dry season. So making them making water supply a bit challenging in this area. And some mentioned um, the max they had to buy it and it's very expensive. They cannot afford. So all these challenges uh, were raised during our discussions with them. So. To conclude, um, we we say that there's a general awareness of uh, of COVID and the rules of transmission and prevention in this area, and we could attribute it to some of the government campaigns that have been going on. But there's little information about uh, the virus itself, which is probably reflecting to the novelty of the virus in Africa and uh, com compared to other diseases that affect this area, like the like onchocerciasis, which is uh, endemic in this area. Now, we also perceived low risks uh, could partly be due to the fact that there has not been any case uh, which they believe not seen uh, is as a result of which they 
they believe that not seeing any um, case means they are not at risk of contracting the disease. And so they don't need to protect themselves from, uh, from the disease or uh, practice any uh, preventive measures. And most of the women are perceived to be at the much lower risks than the men due to limited interactions out of their camps. And thus with these findings, we, we have some recommendations. Firstly, although modern communications and technologies such as radios and cell phones are being used by some of these nomads, many seek continue to rely on their traditional communication approaches such as community gathering, um, community meetings, social gatherings, markets and mosque. This is typically true in this setting because there is the network challenge where if you don't leave your camps down to the certain community, you might not have access to internet or to whatever information that is being passed out. So in as much as we see how we have this modern technology, we should always try to kind of stick to the traditional method of reaching hard to reach populations. Uh, secondly, um, understanding that a key information flow at the moment is, is set to community through uh, the men, the radio, the mosque, and that women are dependent on men for information to be passed on, which means um, uh, important information may be missed out and women uh, may, may not have access to such information. Thus, there is need to identify ways to to actually reach this um, uh, subgroup, especially the women, and to ensure a more gender equality. Now, understanding that the nomadic people have a slight different concern compared to the settled community, particularly around their cattle, there is uh, uh, there is need that uh, campaign information should address concerns of these people uh, kind of separately from the main community because these are two different individuals with two different cultures and and separate uh, um, uh, two different entities so in as much as communication is targeting the general population as a whole there should be a need to have a specific um, uh, or targeted communication to address the needs of um, uh, hard to reach populations nomadic populations um, challenges such as sanitation, which affects uh, access to nomadic uh, communities to prevention and care towards COVID should also be looked into while um, reaching these people. So thank you very much. And uh, for more information, you can uh, read on the article um, from the website listed uh, on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Kareem, for that wonderful presentation. Very, very interesting how you're looking at a very neglected uh, population, the nomadic people. And I do wonder how you go about establishing trust in those communities to start with. You've mentioned some of the barriers that exist there, potentially religious, potentially the gender equity barrier that's already there in terms of their society. And I was just wondering how you go about, you know, establishing that trust platform to start with to then engage and drive sustain, sustain, sustainability. I mean, you know, were you able to make us out of the people you were working with? Were you, did you have advocates that were natural kind of leaders within the nomadic people to kind of carry this message forward after? You know, I, I, you know I, that's something that cropped up. And we'll try and get that into the Q&A at the end but that was a presentation mm. and we really appreciate that. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you. Um, and a lot of people in the audience are saying thank you as well. Uh, we've been joined by Solomon Wafula from Makerere University in Uganda, uh, Edith Nwanko from um, the Nomandi Azaraki University, Alka in Nigeria, um, all agreeing it's excellent. Mary Adomako saying great, everybody. Um, so fantastic. Thank you very, very much for that, Kareem. I think we'll move to the next pres presenter.
Um, and we've heard this morning from Dr. Tina Hoyce and um, from um, in an earlier session and Dr. Mercy Ashipet from the Royal Museum for Central Africa, the Africa Museum and the ATRAP project. Part of that project, um, you know, it, it, part of that project we, we discussed in the kind of session on public engagement. Another addition to that project is from the Mambara University of Science and Technology in Uganda, Dr. Maxon Kenneth Anulitho. And I'm very pleased to, to share the floor with Maxon to, to kind of bring forward some of the community capture of voices for, for this kind of, for this particular session. So thank you very much, Maxon, for joining us. And I'm about to hand the floor over to you. I'm just trying to stop the slide from before. There we go. So the floor is now yours, Maxon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, dear viewers. My name is Maxon Kenneth Anyolito, the PhD student from Barra University of Science and Technology. As has already been mentioned, I am <clears throat> working on the project, part of the bigger project under ATRA, that is a collaboration between Barra University of Science and Technology and uh, the Central Nadrua Museum for Central Africa in Belgium. And my PhD study is on community engagement and systematic prevention, uh, taking the citizen science approach to be able to change among communities of uh, Western Uganda. I am being supervised by Dr. Viola Nyakato from Mbara University and Professor Caroline Pools from University of Antwerp. And then Dr. Tene Yose, who is the overall project uh, uh, investigator for ATRAP and also Dr. Caroline Maskele from University of Antwerp in Belgium. And in this presentation, I focus on the social cultural factors that are associated with the sesosomiasis along the Southern Lake Albert, where we conducted a mixed method study to assess the community's level of knowledge, attitudes, and practices regarding sesosomiasis. And uh, we administered 337 questionnaires to randomly selected uh, respondents. We also held 28 focus group discussions and then conducted 12 in-depth interviews with purposely selected uh, participants of the community. When we analyzed this data, both quantitatively and qualitatively, some of the interesting findings that I am now uh, ready and happy to share with you is that uh, we found that whereas there is this adequate knowledge about the disease, the community expressed knowledge, demonstrated knowledge of the signs and symptoms, the transmission modes, the diagnosis, and even the preventive uh, ways. They also demonstrated positive attitudes towards preventive measures. But what uh, struck us was that uh, uh, quite a number of them still found that, say that they, they could not avoid contact with contaminated water. And this we found was associated with the lack of access to clean and safe water. We also found that there was still common open defecation, especially along the lakes, uh, where people common, uh, defecate either in the lake or in the bushes, and sometimes along the shore. Sometimes they also defecate in the polythene bags during the day, and then they drop the bags in the lake during the night. And also some of the interesting findings that we go through about the myths and misconceptions. Some of them say that uh, if they defecate in the lake, then it helps them to get a lot of fish from the lake because the, the fishes then act as baits that then attract uh, a lot of fish and then they realize a lot of fish uh, catch. We also found there are some stigma and discrimination, discrimination especially by those uh, who uh, have suffered from the disease or are experiencing the signs and symptoms. They are stigmatized by the members of the community. We then said, what should we do? Because we are working with the community. We then developed these findings and then conducted a participatory dissemination and validation of these findings where we use the data party technique. We invited 15 participants comprising the citizen scientists, the community leaders, the VHTs or the village health teams, the religious, cultural, and political and technical leaders. And some of those who had even suffered from the disease, we broke them into their respective groups and then 
gave them these uh, copies of the findings and asked them to brainstorm on these findings. And then in their own groups, we asked them to prioritize three most pressing problems associated with the disease in their communities. And so at the end of the pre uh, groups, we asked them to present their findings. And all these lists of the problems were compiled. And then in a plenary, and then we asked them to discuss these findings and then come up with the three most pressing problems associated with the disease according to their community from the findings that uh, they discuss. So using the prioritization and ranking approach, each of the five sub counties where my study is, uh, is, is situated did the same uh, methodology. And then at the end of the session, we came up with a list of the problems that are associated with the disease that had been prioritized and that had been ranked uh, according to the different uh, communities. So after getting these prioritized problems from the different community sections of the communities, we again invited the 115 participants, and then we asked them that we would like to see how this message, these uh, problems can be addressed in by way of creating awareness. And so we would like to see how we can engage you, the community, in coming up with a communication strategy. So with the World Cafe technique, we again distributed the problems that we had identified in the dissemination of the findings. And then we asked them to brainstorm on these four problems. And then they should be able to come up with the goals of the communication strategy, the objectives of the communication, and then the key messages that should be developed from the findings, from the problems that they identified earlier on, and also which particular audience that uh, these messages should reach, and then who should exactly communicate this message, and then how should this message be communicated to the communities, because they come from the communities and they know that they have already uh, appreciated the problems, so we wanted to see how we can create awareness using a well-developed uh, socially and culturally uh, contextualized communication strategy. So you can see uh, at the lower side there, one of the groups came up with their goal that to have a healthy community of PEFU sub county that is with the reduced burden of uh, Belizea. And then they said they want to improve on the level of knowledge. They want to ensure that they improve on the water, sanitation, and hygiene. They also want to improve access to health services. So after coming up with the well-developed communication strategy through the engagement of the different categories of the communities with the citizen scientists at the forefront, we then invited the citizen scientists for a two-day training in which we equip them with the skills uh, and knowledge on how to communicate, but also how to communicate to audience of diverse backgrounds, and then also how to communicate so some ISIS, uh, information. After that training, then we sent them to the communities to do community mobilization and then organize and mobilize the different categories of the communities that would participate in the creation of the awareness. So when they went to the communities, during the training, they identified about five to six different channels. One, conducting home visits. Uh, two, uh, doing uh, <clears throat> community meetings. And then three, uh, having dramas, theater and songs and dances, but also having printed materials with the input uh, generated from the citizen scientists themselves, and then also conducting a football tournament. So in this one is where the citizen scientists were seriously and actively involved in disseminating information in creating awareness about uh, the disease in their respective communities. They use the print materials, uh, the messages that were generated with input from the citizen scientists themselves. So they would move to the different homesteads and gather the members of the homesteads and begin to pass to them the messages using the print materials, but also using the training guides that we had shared with them during the training. Some of the places where they could not find the members of the homestead, they would gather the community members in public places like markets, the landing sites, and also trading centers. And then they would use the local systems like the megaphones and also the community radios to do mobilization of the members 
and then they would pass their communication, uh, the, the social message messages. And then when they were moving to the home states, they would also uh, put the materials, especially the posters, which were generated, which were developed together uh, with the input from the citizen scientists, and then they would put them in the strategic locations like the doors and then the fences or the walls uh, where members of the home states would access the, the, the messages and read them both in English and also in the local language. And then finally, they engaged the communities when they went to the communities, they identified groups, but they also identified individuals that they train using the materials that we gave them on the messages that they should pass, uh, like uh, debunking the myths and misconceptions that they identified during the dissemination and also during the development of the strategy. They also pass messages about uh, the discouraging communities from the use of uh, uh, risky practices like uh, access to, I mean, using contaminated water or defecating outside uh, the latrines. So they were passing messages through songs, through dramas, but also through theaters, which were very appreciative by the communities and they would understand it because also it was in their local languages. So during the communication strategies, there were also key messages that were identified by the citizen scientists that we use to develop uh, signboards, which were put at strategic places, at hotspots, for example, where people uh, have, where there's a common defecation, open defecation, they would put there that don't defecate here, rather use toilets. And also in uh, areas along the lakes where people go and fetch water or go and use, uh, get into contact with contaminated water, they will say, don't use this water or don't fetch it water here, rather use clean and safe water. So that was very interesting because then the communities would see those signages and then they would read them and then it would change their behavior. Finally, the citizen scientists also got involved in mobilizing football teams from the different communities where they, they come from, where they do their work. And then they also organized the tournaments and then with the support from the project, they were able to bring the people together and then people came and the clubs participated in the tournament. And during that tournament, then the citizen scientists would use the public address systems to speak about uh, Beliza, about Sosomasis, because there were quite a number of people who came to watch the football. And so it was used an opportunity as an opportunity to pass the, the messages. They also used that as an opportunity to, to, to distribute flyers and also put posters in other public places and also banners that were developed by the project and they were put along the road so that those who are not able to watch the football can read the messages on the banner as they move along the roads. So down there are some of the football teams that were now in the final stages of the tournament. Last but not least, after the Awareness Week, we invited again the citizen scientists to interact with a, a diverse uh, section of uh, stakeholders from the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda and also Ministry of Health, but also some of the NGOs that are involved in the WASH uh, sector within the study area. We invited them, then they interacted with the citizen scientists where the citizen scientists presented to the stakeholders and interacted with them on the pressing social and cultural problems associated with the disease. So that then these stakeholders would take some of these recommendations for either policy implementation and also for the actual implementation, especially by the NGOs that are engaged in the wash sector. Right now, what we are now doing in the past one week after a conducting the awareness campaigns. We are now trying to use a participatory process, conduct a participatory process evolution of the citizen science approach. We are using the most significant change story approach where by we selected uh, nine citizen scientists and we are collecting stories from them. They should be able to tell us a story of what has changed in their lives since their involvement in the project. 
And these change stories, we came up with domains of change that guide in their storytelling. After collecting these stories, then we will develop the stories, compile them, and then present them to a, another set of citizen scientists who did not write, tell our stories, but should be able to re read through the stories and relieve them and compare with their experiences and the experiences of the communities and should be able to tell us which story catches and speaks to the intervention and speaks to the experiences of the community. That is then what we will be able to document, to be able to evaluate and see whether citizen science is really a good approach. It is an approach that can be used in communicating information for behavior change. So we see that some important take home for now. One is that when we properly train and guide these citizen scientists, they can actually disseminate study findings to the communities in the local context, but also in their local situations. And also citizen science we see can be an effective model for co-designing a community-based communication strategy in a socially and culturally contextualized manner. Next, we see that citizen science seems to be a more preferred approach to communication of systematic information compared to other approaches of volunteering like the, VH, the village health teams and other NGO supported approaches. Why? We have interacted with the community and what they're telling us is that the citizen science are actually the local scientists because now they have evidence of the snails, they have evidence of the water sources and water types because of their involvement in the research process and they are able to explain and uh, describe the process of the life cycle of the disease and also how people should take preventive measures. So finally we see that this can help us to realize a sustainable and community shared problem solving approach. Thank you and thank you and thank you. Thank you very, very much, Maxon, for that wonderful presentation and completely with you. I mean, that you've taken a slice straight the way through immersive, participatory co-design. Best parts of it, really, I thought. Absolutely. Some of the feedback, Joanne Butler, this has been enormously helpful because I'm looking at carrying out similar public engagement events in rural Ghana, hoping to see you know, visuals, illustrations to spread the message of NTDs and how to recognize signs on the skin. She's taking a lot of notes. So I think all of the presenters have really um, inspired uh, everybody. So lots of, uh, Professor Rod did in lots of ideas, great presentation. I thought it was a fantastic um, effort there, Maxon, as well. We ourselves, you mentioned theater, we run something called Acting for Health. We were in Mayuji district in, uh, in Uganda for doing local theater for Shisto actually, the lived experience in the local language. Uh, so I totally with you in terms of the, the solutions are at some level with those communities. We just not speaking with them in that way. Um, so absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Tina Hoyce, a big applause for all the speakers. So I'm gonna kind of ask one question to everybody, if that's okay, um, and just to get a bit of feedback. When we talk about communities and we talk about sustainability and reshaping the way we talk and engage with them, the first entry point is trust, right? So my question to all of you is how do you build that first step of trust? Neglected communities, disease, um, socioeconomic factors, religious factors, uh, all sorts of factors, are there as a barrier to building trust? How do you build trust? If I could ask you to keep your answers very succinct, we've got a couple of minutes, I just wanted to ask that. How do you build trust? I wanna ask Caroline first. Caroline, over to you. Sure, oh. thanks Cameron. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, Trust is incredibly important within the leprosy community because of the history of discrimination and stigma that this community has faced. Um, we work to build trust through our partnerships. And I think that um, that work definitely takes 
takes time. Um, and we look to our partners who have been involved in the leprosy community and in this work for decades, some of them over 100 years, and their longstanding relationships with organizations of persons affected. I think that we can further develop trust with persons affected um, by making sure we give as many opportunities to them to speak directly to our audiences um, sure. rather than trying to speak for them. So providing platforms, um, but allowing them to, you know, inviting them to speak for their own community. Thanks. Fantastic. Further immersion uh, in that. So that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Tice, I'd like to ask you the same question. How do you build the initial trust to then you know, propel your program forward? You've got a double-sided thing there because you've got a product in, a, in essence at the end, a fashion show or economy with the jewelry. So how do you, so that's something else, but how do you build trust? Yes. Um, I'm just, the question is to you. How do you? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think the the main uh, tip or the main lesson that we learn is that we build trust when we listen, and we show the people uh, that we are aware of their stories and that we are there to um, to help. And, uh, and actually, when we think about the project and also about the communications, um, it is important to uh, to show them, uh, to, ex to explain what we are doing. Why are we entering those people's house? Why are we at yeah. the health center? And uh, so that they we can listen and they can also understand our presence, our goals, and our meanings. Um, I think the the bottom line is just to be part of their lives and to show empathy. This is how we can trust and yeah. we can continue this relationship. I love the, the lyric you used. Um, we want to concentrate on ability, not disability. I thought that was, that was excellent. Yeah, so that's a great another great answer. Thank you. For for that. Uh, Professor Rod Dillon is saying building trust, find out their expertise and ask them to teach your incoming group a new skill, like growing a crop, etc. So some feedback there um, from, from Professor Rod Dillon. Um, I'll ask the same question to Kareen um, in terms of the, the, the nomadic um, community that you're working with. You mentioned some of those issues there, the gender equity issue when it came to information flow. And I'm assuming that's ingrained in their kind of way of life. And then also the, uh, the perhaps the religious uh, aspect in terms of mosques. Is that a mode that we can use to build that initial trust? Yeah, that is um, one approach. But, yeah. Hello, are you getting me? Okay, that's one approach. And another main approach we can capitalize yeah. on is um, actually some sort of community entry. How do you enter the community? How do you perceive the community? How do you see the community? Now, if um, you, you enter a community, you make them believe, make them uh, aware, or make them know that this is their project, or this is, uh, they own this activity, they participate in it, that is a way of using the trust. You cannot just come into a community yeah. and and do what you like. So in a nutshell, the yeah. community another aspect is using the community members in the activity. What we did in the nomadic um, uh, um, community is like we train the nomadic citizens, the nomadic job distributors. We trained them. We incorporated them into the project so that they should feel that it is their own. It is not site savers, it is not outsiders. So that in a nutshell yeah. was a way of gaining their trust and, and making it effective. That's a fantastic answer. I think that resonates with all the presentations today, starting from Caroline's to, to, to Tase's, to yourselves and to Maxon in terms of that involvement 
and ha he hearing. So, I mean, that's a, the fantastic answer, giving them that opportunity to speak and listening to them and bringing that forward in the messaging. Max, on as a, as a concluding, um, any concluding thoughts on that, that question of trust? You seem to have been really immersed. And I've seen from um, Tina and Mercy's uh, presentation and from the previous Connect session that we had with them earlier in the year, it's a very, very well thought out uh, project. What are your views on this trust building scenario? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just to emphasize on what my colleagues have always said, I think uh, going by our experience, we see that the first and the most important thing has been the involvement of the communities, the involvement of the local leadership right from the beginning up to the end of the process of the project is very, very key to allow them to build trust in the process. For our case, we involve the local leadership first in the selection of the citizen scientists. The leaders were involved in recommending and proposing to us the people that they trust, the people that they think should be able to volunteer to their benefit. Another thing that I think that should help us yeah. to build trust is yeah. making the community to understand, to appreciate exactly what the project is. Does it speak to their problems? Does it speak to their minds? Yeah. Does it speak to their challenges, for example? Once they understand this, then they are able to, to build trust. For our case, because the citizen scientists are involved in the whole research process, right from the snail's identification to water sampling, then they are able to explain this to the communities that they did not actually have any idea about this and relating it to the disease. Yeah. And then lastly, the issue of leading from behind. If we lead from behind and we make the communities to take the center stage, the front stage, then they are able to build trust in whatever we are doing. Thank you very much. I mean, that, that's, a, that, that, that's a fantastic answer. And I think some of the questions that were coming through from Edith Nowanko, uh, Bior Garang, all of them, uh, some fascinating, uh, all touching on these points that you're making. And I'm just going to leave you with this thought. You guys should partnership together. Do a partnership together. There's a so much you can learn. We're seeing it from this side. So everything you've said kind of complements all the projects that are on this table in this session, I hope something comes out of it. I think there's a lot going on that needs to be discussed and um, learned from, frankly. So I'd just like to say thank you very, very much. I wish we had longer, because I wanted to get right into this, but we always give ourselves one and a half hours, and unfortunately the time's up. A big, big thank you to all of you, Caroline, Tice, Karine, and Masanko. Thank you very, 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 very much indeed for, for all of that. That was wonderful.